I want to see you enjoying Valentine's Day. My Valentine is beautiful. Auburn hair pulled back in a ponytail. Little buds poking through the front of her sleeveless t-shirt clearly braless. Short silk boxers and pink ankle socks. It's erotic in a cozy way that belies an intimacy which is far beyond superficial erotica. I wiggle my ass to sit more comfortably, and tiny waves of pleasure remind me that I won't be needing a little blue pill tonight. She's sitting at the desk in her bedroom, long, slender legs spread out before her. Fuck, she's gorgeous. The sliding glass door faces the tiny patio outside her bedroom, three feet past the apartment's edge. A short wall supports the steep, ivy-covered hillside beyond. I am sitting in the ivy again tonight, once again covered in darkness, as the light from her bedroom puts her on stark display. I'm directly across from her, that she can't see me. She never sees me. She picks up her phone and looks at the number. Her face wrinkles in disgust, and she silences the call. I take a gulp from my thermos, it's chilly again tonight, and reach for the Vaseline. The jar is almost empty. I have to buy a new one each week. There's a rustling from behind and above me, and I instantly freeze. Am very well hidden when it's dark, but anyone with a flashlight would find my nest immediately. Slowly, I turn around. There's a shadowed figure walking in the darkness. My pulse races, and I can feel Vomit's finger tickling the back of my throat. Crunch, crunch, crunch. He's walking down the hill, and he's getting closer to me. Then he stops. He pulls something out of his pocket. It glows, and I can see the outline of his scowl. Her phone rings. She gives it half a glance before immediately hanging up. The man's phone light turns off. His call has been terminated. Then I understand it's that fucking guy Ned, who must be the pushiest asshole in Salt Lake City, Utah. Has been asking her out for six months now, and my valentine is simply disgusted by his advances. I know all about her life, because I thoroughly catalog what I find in her trash can each day. I look at him with such fury that I nearly shatter the Vaseline jar in my white knuckle grip. Ned is such a creep. Then the light from her apartment glints off the blade in his hand, and my heart stops. His holding an enormous hunting knife. I want to cry. I cannot imagine anything bad happening to my sweet Valentine. She deserves the very best. After months of me licking her silverware, Osh is at work to make sure it isn't poisoned. Fucking Ned is going to kidnap her. He takes a step forward, and I act. Of course, I have my Nikon D750 DSLR camera. At the ready, I've taken 1913 photos just tonight. But the flash attachment is rarely used, for obvious reasons. This time, however, I turn it on. Then I point and shoot. Ned is negotiating the tricky hillside right as the flash blinds him, and the effect is perfect. I catch an instant of pure shock on his face. He tumbles and comes to a rest at the bottom of the hill, right where the short retaining wall meets her patio. All is still. I crane my neck slowly, surely, to see why he isn't moving. And from my angle, it's obvious. The hunting knife has come to rest deep in his left temple. One eye has popped, and the socket is filled with nothing but white jelly. Has dead. She glances outside with a look of concern and a furrowed brow. She might have noticed the flash from the corner of her eye, but she hadn't been facing me at that exact second. And her door is fucking soundproof, trust me. Moreover, from where she sits, 
it is impossible to see the pitch-black hillside. It's okay. When the morning light comes, it will illuminate my gift to her. She will see Ned's fresh corpse in her backyard, and she will know that there is a love all round her that she cannot see. Always watching. Happy Valentine's Day. My sweet story too. A random woman on the street gave me a Valentine's Day card. I wish I hadn't opened it. It read, Will you be mine? There was no name, no one to whom it had originally addressed, just a crumpled red envelope and a mostly blank white card with the aforementioned question written inside on the right. The black ink had smeared either at the time of writing or sometime during its travels through the curious woman's pocket. It somehow made the question seem sad, desperate. She gave me one last glance, then stepped away, mingling with the crowd that seemed to appear from out of nowhere that very moment. I didn't know what to do, and had anyone else given it to me, I probably would have tossed it. But the woman had been strangely, unconventionally attractive, so I kept it. I used it to buoy my spirits after what had been a particularly frustrating day at work. She could have given it to anyone, but she had chosen me. Back home, I set it on the kitchen counter and started to make myself something to eat. A few minutes into dinner preparations, I got this feeling in the back of my neck like there was someone watching me. Turning around, I scanned my small apartment, able to see the entirety of the kitchen and the living room beyond from where I was standing at the stove. There wasn't anyone in sight, and yet I still felt as if I were being observed. It was around 8 p.m. Night had already set in, but my living room curtains were still open. I crossed the room, closed them, and returned to the kitchen. The ominous feeling lingered, but I ignored it and finished cooking. Halfway through eating dinner there was a knock at the door. I.D. never had anyone stop by to visit before, so the occurrence was at once alarming. I sat there, frozen mid-chew, hoping that there'd been some kind of mistake. But another knock came, rising from the table. I gripped my fork in my hand and crept toward the front door, trying not to announce my occupancy of the apartment. Reaching the door, I peered through the peephole, not exactly dreading what I'd see, but hoping not to see anyone. My hope panned out there wasn't anyone there, and yet this unnerved me, because I hadn't heard any departing footsteps. Carefully, for gripped tightly in my right hand, I opened the door an inch. No one occupied the space beyond, so I opened it all the way. The threshold was empty. Both ends of the hall were empty. I didn't notice the evidence that anyone had even been there until I took a tentative step into the hall. Turning around to re-enter my apartment, I saw that someone had written something on the door, an unsettlingly familiar phrase, Will you be my mine? And just like the ink in the card, the writing dark paint I hoped was smeared the letter E in mine no more than a trailing blot. I hurried back inside and slammed the door. My heart was going crazy. I sensed that something was happening, that I was being subjected to some kind of prank or harassment. I had to hold on to the wall as I made my way back to the kitchen, my anxiety making my steps unsteady. As I returned to my seat at the table, my appetite utterly lost, I was suddenly beset with the urge to look at the card again, to read it again, even though I knew what was written inside. I went over, grabbed it from the counter, and sat back down at, shoving my unwanted dinner aside. I withdrew the card from its envelope 
and set it on the table, a feeling of mounting unrest making my hands tremble. The blank white face of the card seemed to augur some terrible yet unguessable news, an infinite array of cryptic possibilities. Finally, I willed my hands to open the card. Inside, written on every single inch of space, was the phrase, Will you be mine? Over and over, in every direction, some instances more erratic than others. There was a terrible and terrifying variety to the scribblings. I.D. never felt more disturbed by such a relatively simple thing. Will you bemen? Will you bemen? Will you bemen? It threw the card away, but after a few moments spent on the couch trying to calm myself, I got up, fetched my candle lighter, and burned the card in the kitchen sink. As the flames consumed it, crumpling and blackening the material, I felt a new sensation. Not exactly nausea, but a bodily lightness. I gripped the counter, attempting to steady myself. It wasn't until I had practically keel over that I noticed the fumes weren't gray or black or the color of any smoke ID. Seen before but red, as red as the envelope the card had been in. Consciousness began to ebb away just as I heard the front door open. I remembered then that I had locked the door and merely slammed it in my panic. You idiot, I thought to myself as darkness took me. I awoke on my kitchen table, and the first thing I noticed was the chill I was naked had been stripped completely. Given the circumstances as terrible as they were, I expected to be bound, but I was not, and promptly rolled off the table when I shifted my weight. I landed hard on my shoulder, and briefly hoped that I de pass out again, if only to stop the flare of pain. Recovering, using the table for leverage, I stood up. My senses were rekindled completely when I saw what was smeared on the table's surface. It was unmistakably blood, my blood as if activated by the sight, my nerves exploded, and pain coursed down the front of my body. I fell to my knees, my body overwrought with agony, with one eye open the other closed, as if that had somehow mollified the painy examine myself. From the top of my chest all the way down to my groin was the word mine carved into my skin as erratically as the darkly enigmatic question in the card. It was like I had been claimed, the word lacking a question mark, the wound still fresh a grisly statement of ownership. Every movement, no matter how subtle, brought a new spike of breath-stealing pain, so I just stayed there, kneeling on my kitchen floor as errant streams of blood trickled, from the wounds that had not yet coagulated, my one attempt to call for help brought so much pain that I almost fainted, so I refrained from doing even that, not wanting to bleed out while unconscious. I stayed like that for over an hour, until my body had grown somewhat accustomed to the debilitation. Then I stood, cringing against the only slightly diminished Taganian shedding no small number of Tirsan, called the police. They came, I was taken to the hospital, and they investigated what they could of my apartment and the evidence therein. I've yet to hear any news of a lead or idea of the perpetrator. They've only informed me that the card one ID Burnett had been taken into evidence. I was shocked at this, and it must have shown on my face because the officer asked if something was wrong. I asked him how they had recovered the card, given what I'd done, and he said that there wasn't anything wrong with it, that the alleged fire hadn't damaged it at all. An itch in the back of my mind compelled me to ask him another question, even as I grappled to comprehend what had told me. What did the card say inside? The officer met my eyes for a moment, 
the look of slight bewilderment on his face. It said, I'm glad you're mine. Wants him well enough to leave the hospital, him finding a new place to live. The landlord can have everything in my apartment. I'm never going back there. For the first time in my life, I'm happy I'll be spending Valentine's Day alone. Story 3. Do not open until Valentine's Day. I need your help. Every year around February I get like this. My appetite is absent. My thoughts become cluttered. I have to take a week off from work just to cope with the anxiety. Every year, a day or two before Valentine's Day, I get mailed an envelope from my daughter. They are always titled the same. Do not open until Valentine's Day and contain a piece of ripped paper with an image printed on them. I always wait until Valentine's Day to open them and that day is approaching fast. This year will be the fourteenth year in a row she has mailed one. The only problem is my daughter disappeared fourteen years ago. It all started when my daughter, Riley, was eight. Her mother and I just divorced, and it was nasty. We fucking hated each other. I'll admit I can be stubborn sometimes, but according to her, every bad thing that happened was my fault. Her finger was always pointed at me. There were so many nights Riley couldn't sleep because of our yelling. Looking back, the divorce was in our best interest, especially Riley's. But still, I can't imagine how difficult it was for Riley watching her mother and I drift apart. My lawyer was expensive as shit but worth it when joint custody was granted. My marriage was terrible but it brought the flower of the world into my life, Riley. Arrangements were made for each of us to keep Riley to weeks at a time, and both of us living in the same school district made transport easy. Having to deal with her crazy mother on occasion was a pain in the ass, but well worth it to see my girl. As she grew up, her curiosity astonished me, and open my eyes to things you miss as an adult. She loved trips to the zoo, pushing her doll in a stroller and swinging. I taught her how to ride a bike with no training wheels, and she taught me how to appreciate endless hours of Disney movies. My favorite times with Riley were holidays. My side of the family treated her like a princess, and she soaked up the attention like a sponge. We always had so much fun playing games or exploring outside. She loved spending holidays with me, but usually didn't get too. Her overbearing mother caused a stir if Riley washed with her side of the family for holidays, and I usually didn't put up a fight. I knew to pick my battles carefully. Since she couldn't see me on most major holidays, she started mailing me things. She was sad I couldn't see her on Thanksgiving or Christmas, so she would cut out funny images she saw in a newspaper, magazine, or the internet and mail them to me a few days before the holiday. She always titled the envelopes with Do Not Open Until Insert Holiday. She started enjoying her little collage projects, and I started receiving them on New Year, Halloween, Fourth of July, and Valentine's Day. The next time she would come over, she asked if I waited until the actual holiday to open them, which I always did. It was a fun way for us to get around the two-week rule. I started putting all of her envelopes and cutouts into a bin. I've held on to each and every one. She was my little angel that could instantly put me in a good mood. Her body may have been small, but her heart was large enough for the two of us. I don't know how she turned out so caring after all the shit her mother and I put her through, but God I cared for her so much. One morning, I was woken by an authoritative knock at my door. The police eagerly searched my home, 
and questioned me for hours that I was more confused than helpful. I lost my shit when they said Riley was missing. I sucked up my pride to join my ex-wife in helping the police any way we could. The search began immediately. The Amber Alert had already been issued, and the whole community searched for my little angel. She has never been found. After getting my ex-wife's neighbors and others' testimony, the police pieced together their best assumption as to what happened. The report said Riley waited at the end of the driveway for the school bus. Her mother let Riley stand by herself while getting ready for work. The next time she looked for Riley, she was gone and suspected the bus had picked her up and she was on the way to school. The bus driver said she never saw Riley that day. When the school called my ex-wife about Riley's absence an hour later, the police were called. Over the next few days, tips came in, but nothing was substantive. As the attention faded, so did the help. As the help faded, so did my optimism. When the police called off the search two weeks later, I smashed the fuck out of my bedroom drywall in a rage. I had a phase where I blamed my ex-wife for being irresponsible. I had a binge drinking phase. Hell, I even had a suicidal phase that went so far as a pistol purchase. The light of my life had been extinguished by some random perv or fucking maniacal abductor. Nothing helped ease the pain, and that following year crept by slowly. Then I received an envelope. Startled by the writing, I dropped it on the ground when I read the front. Do not open until Valentine's Day. The handwriting was shockingly similar, and even the apostrophe was missing, something she always forgot. I lost it. Tears streamed down my face while I sobbed harder than I had in my life. My sorrow quickly turned to anger when I realized what happened. Someone was playing the sickest fucking joke imaginable, and I had to find out who. I called my ex-wife, but she brushed off my anger as pathetic. I called a few friends who might have known something, but no one did. When I finally opened the envelope, the only thing it contained was a small, torn piece of paper with a printed image of a monkey. After calming my rage and getting my wits about me, I threw everything into a plastic bag to take to the police. Did one of her letters get trapped in the mail only to be sent a year late? Is it a cruel joke? Is her abductor taunting me? Is Riley Liv? None of my questions were answered after they analyzed the mail. No fingerprints, no fibers, no DNA, fucking nothing. The only helpful information I received was, since there was no stamp or return address, then someone put it in the mailbox personally. After six months of testing the envelope, and monkey image was returned to me. I put it in the box with the rest of Riley's gifts. The event was so peculiar it never left my mind. I spend hours going over possible scenarios of her disappearance and how one of her gifts got to me a year late. I spend that year a recluse from my family and friends while trying to make sense of what happened. My heart needed to heal alone. On February 12th, the following year, another envelope came. It had the same handwriting and title. Do not open until Valentine's Day. I didn't get upset. Somehow it gave me peace. I followed the instructions and two days later opened it. A small piece of paper with an orange on it was inside. I put it in with the others. This has continued for the last 13 years, 14 if one comes this year. The first for envelopes contained images of a, an, monkey, orange, mailbox, mouse, or mice, after for unsuccessful attempts in four years, the police could not find any information. 
Every year I brought them my newest gift, and every year they told me no evidence was found. They knew it was odd for me to get letters the same time every year, but since they were not threatening, they couldn't do much else. They advised I ignore them, since it could be a prank. After the fourth year, I stopped showing them. The next three years, I was mailed images of a and colon do dash yo kite igloo. A few months after I received the cutout of the igloo, I was called about Riley's disappearance. A young college filmmaker wanted to do a low-budget documentary on her disappearance and asked permission from me. Publicity could only help Riley's situation, so I agreed. The interview was difficult, but the college kid was accommodating enough to interview my ex-wife on a different occasion. I never mentioned the envelopes. After it was released online, the cops got a few more tips, but nothing materialized. The next February, I set up a camera to record my mailbox. I wanted to catch the person in the act. However, after getting another envelope, I searched the footage to find an error had occurred. The last twelve hours were just static. This new envelope gave me a rush while opening it. It was like Riley was still talking to me. Sure, I had doubts, but sometimes the only thing keeping a man sane are his delusions. The handwriting was still the same. It was still Riley's. The envelope's image was Ofa. Lemuri continued living my life. I've had a construction job for nine years now that pays well and keeps the hours consistent. My girlfriend lives with me, and she is great. But I have kept the gifts from Riley a secret. Even my ex-wife doesn't know about them. When asked why I take off around Valentine's Day, I just tell everyone it's in honor of my daughter. The next years brought in large images. The thick folded pieces were glossy, like from a nice magazine. They were a and light bulb elephant. I continued saving all the gifts. Every year was like a present from Riley. My assumption of a prank faded years ago knowing no one would keep this up that long. The next three years brought envelopes containing a and dog M-O-P ear or earring. Here is the envelope and the ear or earring cut out from last year. H-T-T-P-S colon slash slash I-M-G-U-R dot com slash gallery slash Y-P-W-X-O. The last thirteen years have been a hard battle to fight. Not knowing where Riley is or if she is even still alive eats at my soul. I've managed the pain as best I could, but these damn envelopes bring it all back. I have no idea why anyone would do this as a prank, but I equally can't believe it's anyone other than Riley. Every year my mailbox camera malfunctions goes blank or is consumed with static the day I receive the envelopes. I have no proof that someone is fucking with me, and it drives me crazy. Would anyone really torment me this long? Riley would be twenty-two now, and I'm sure just as sweet as when she was taken from me. Valentine's Day is approaching, and the anxiety has me reaching out for guidance. I can't make sense of the situation, so I'm asking for any help or solutions to this strange puzzle. Story for the perfect gift for Valentine's Day. I had been racking my brain trying to think of the perfect gift for my lover. It had to be something beautiful, but also thoughtful. I couldn't just give her something that was meaningless or would break in a few years. I'd been thinking about this for a long time, and I think now I might have found it. A little background, the woman in dating is named Christy. She has short brown hair cut at a diagonal. Her eyes are big and bright. She's got a petite figure complete with provocative tattoos. 
She is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I guess it's shallow, but it's what first drew me to her. She sat in the bar alone, sipping something colorful out of a mason jar. It's not something I'm proud of, but I often prowled the bar looking for hot girls. Christy was different, though. Sure, she was hot, but she also had a kind of ethereal beauty that transcended physical attractiveness. She practically glowed. I approached her and offered to buy her a drink. When she smiled, I felt my entire body tingle. She moved like a snake towards me, her legs slithering next to mine. Her touch was intoxicating. I think I knew right then that it was destiny. That was three months ago. We haven't known each other very long, but I know for certain she's the one. It's something I can't explain in words. She just drew me in and I was done for. Everything just made sense. Unfortunately, we were both going to be busy on Valentine's Day, so I have to give the gift tonight. I set the mood before she gets home. I scatter rose petals across the floor leading to our bedroom. I light as many candles as I owned. I prepare the bedroom and can't help but smile as I complete the finishing touches. Christy gets to my house at five. She is floored by the amount of effort I put into the gift. I undress her slowly, letting my fingers linger on her glowing skin. She is so excited her skin prickles to my touch. With careful hands I tie the silk blindfold around her eyes. She is giggling. She must think I have some sort of sexy surprise for her, but the truth is the gift is so much more. I lead her into the bedroom. She keeps laughing and asking what to expect. I tease her and tell her to be patient. We enter the candlelit room. She can feel the warmth from the flames, and she makes a soft cooing noise. I move her into the center and tell her to wait for me. She stands impatiently, grinning. Seeing her body in the warm light makes my heart race. I kneel down and complete the circle of salt around her. What's taking you so long? Christy asks in a playful tone. I just need to finish up one last thing, I reply. The circle of salt is finished along with seven candles along the rim. I take my Swiss army knife and cut my palm deep, allowing the blood to drip slowly onto the floor like a broken faucet. Christy starts wriggling. Eh, hey, what's going on? I'm going to take off the blind. Not yet, I didn't mean to yell, but I need her to remain still. She stops moving and wraps her arms around her chest. I go to the walk-in closet and open the door. Lying there, as she usually does, is my lover. Her wrinkled skin is so thin I have to wrap a blanket around her to keep it from tearing. She is unconscious. She has been for the past six months. Her gray gnarled hair snags on my fingers as I lift her carefully. I walk over to the circle. Christy is obviously uncomfortable. Not that I care. As long as her body is intact, then the gift will be completed. I lay my lover down inside the circle. The flames of the candles burn hotter, and a howl of wind whips through the air. Christy whimpers, I don't like this. Shut up, I tell her. She backs up and touches my lover with her foot. She screams and rips off the blindfold. What the fuck? She runs towards me, but is caught by the circle of salt and falls to the floor. She stares confused at the invisible wall. Her nose bleeds slightly. I lean in closer. Don't do that again. You'll hurt yourself. Christy tries to scramble wave from the body on the floor. What's going on? She is desperate. They are always desperate. I sit down on the floor facing the two women, Christy, young and vibrant, and my lover, 
Aubel, trapped in the dying body of an elderly woman. My excitement rises. With a stern voice I recite, Chuo plays the harp, who makes ashes of men. Come back, come back, my dying love undead. Take the sa, doom her instead. Christy begins screaming. My smile flashes in the dying candlelight. She grasps at her throat as it closes. She tries to call for help, but her voice is fading. Owl screams through her, and the body falls to the ground. I pause a moment in the darkness. My love, Christy says open with a start. She sits up and looks at me. Her smile is one I have known for thousands of years. You have done well, Aupol says. She stands shakily, touching her new naked form. This body is beautiful. You deserve nothing less, I say to her, bowing deeply. The old woman begins crying. Aupol stands over her. What would you like to do with the girl? It is up to you, my lover. Aubo motions to me and I stand. She takes my hand and steps outside of the salt circle. I drag Christy, now trapped in the old woman's body, onto the bed. Aubo is pleased with me. She uses her new teeth to bite into Christy's neck, drinking her aging blood. Christy tries to scream, but nothing comes out. Her throat is dry and she is almost dead. Aubo rips a piece of flesh from Christie's stomach. She beckons and invites me to join. Soon we are both covered in the gore that was once Christie's life. Aubo takes a momentary break from her meal and strokes my face. This is a wonderful gift, she says softly. I lean into her hand. You deserve this. And Story so much five. more. A girl asked me out for Valentine's Day. You still haven't told me why you asked me out for Valentine's Day, I reminded Kyrie. Don't worry, she smirked. If you haven't figured it out by the end of the night, I'll tell you. Her gloved fingers slid between mine and she gave my hand a little squeeze. I couldn't believe this was happening. I'd had a crush on Kyrie since the moment we met. Even though she'd shown up at my apartment with a guy I couldn't stand. Johnny was my roommate's best friend. He and his crew only ever showed up after midnight, drunk, high, and looking for trouble. Things were always broken or missing in the morning. But my roommate Nate refused to control his friends. The night I met Kyrie... I woke to the sound of drunken giggles and the apartment door slamming open. Wait, are you just standing out there for? A slurred voice shouted. Come in, it's gold, it groaned. Johnny. In the main room, I could see my roommate Nate leaning boozily against the wall. A big blonde girl tried to dance on our coffee table and kicked a hole in it. Meanwhile, Johnny was ranting about a band he hated and preparing a line of coke on a handheld mirror. Blood rushed to my head. I was shoving my way toward him before I had time to think. My parents had struggled with addiction all their lives, and a dirty needle had been my mother's death sentence. I didn't want to see that stuff. Didn't want it in my home where I lived. Put that away. Get it out of here, I snap. Come on, man. It's my party fuel. Don't like it. Go back to bed, Johnny sneered. A short girl with frizzy brown hair watched me carefully. It's his house, Johnny. His rules. The girl rolled her eyes. Don't like it. Get your own place. Instead of mooching off of Nate all the time, Johnny turned red and glared at Mebiot. He also put the coke away. Carrie introduced herself, but I can't remember anything about the conversation. I was too focused on her dark hazel eyes and how my heart was racing in my chest. After the party, she did something none of Johnny's friends had ever done. 
She stayed to help clean up. By the way, Kyrie asked, wiping a red jello shot off of the counter, what are you doing for Valentine's Day? Well, it's a Tuesday, so probably work, and then the gym, I laughed, then started rambling. I couldn't help myself. I mean, I'm sure I'll end up getting on a dating app or going to a bar, because nothing's worse than sitting at home alone on Valentine's Day. How about I pick you up at eight? Kyrie asked. My jaw dropped at some point I must have nodded, because here I was, on my first date of the new year. If it was a date, even when we walked hand in hand into the ice skating rink, I wasn't completely sure what I was doing here. Unsurprisingly, the skating rink was packed with couples. Some twirled, others stumbled. But as we laced up our skates, Kyrie pointed to a young man and a five-year-old child. Look at those two. What do you see? She whispered to me. A single dad, I guess, I grasped for more details. The handsome young man held the boy's hand, teaching him. They're both struggling, so I guess it's their first time here and, judging from the way he keeps looking around and checking his watch, he's probably meeting somebody here. You notice things? Kyrie raised an eyebrow, impressed. That's one of the things I like about you. Keep watching. We made our way onto the ice. I did my best to keep an eye on the pair in the sea of skaters. A strikingly beautiful woman with raven hair stepped effortlessly onto the ice all smiles. The man grinned and waved. His date was here. He embraced her, but his boy tried to pull away. The kid stomp skated away, looking over his shoulder with wide-eyed fear. His father and the new date followed. The man barely seemed to notice his son. He just stared into the woman's eyes dreamily and allowed her to lead him around the ice. I had to admit I understood the feeling. I couldn't say exactly what it was that made the raven-haired woman so special, but it was hard to look away from her. She twirled her date gracefully and pressed him against the rink barrier, leaning in close. She whispered something into his ear. He lay back and closed his eyes, savoring it like he couldn't believe his luck. Meanwhile, the bow was running out of energy. He grabbed his knees, panting, and the raven-haired woman shot across the ice toward him like a swooping owl. An expert skater, she clamped a hand over his mouth with one hand and guided him to the exit with the other. It was over before I could react, before I even realized what was going on. A sea of happy couples blocked my path to the door. The boy's father rubbed his eyes, glancing around like a man waking from sleep. Then the panic set in. He stumbled around the ice, grabbing people asking if they'd seen his son. Kyrie tugged my hand gently, urging me to follow. But by the time we reached the packed lobby and clumsily pulled off our skates, I knew that it was already too late. The raven-haired woman and the boa were long gone. I stared, slack-jawed, at the man's babbling attempt to explain what had happened to the rink attendant. Kyrie tugged my hand again. Wes Howell, go. You knew, in the snowy darkness of the parking lot, I confronted Kyrie. How she smirked and kept walking. Hey, I shouted. That man's son could be in danger. What's going on? Like I said, you notice things. I'm confident you'll figure it out. Kyrie looked up into the cloudy night sky and sigh, an unreadable expression on her face. But first, you sound like you need a drink. I know a club downtown. XXY read the pink and purple neon letters above the solid metal door. I'd never heard of this place here, even this street before. 
but then I hadn't been to a club since college. I really, really hoped Kyrie wouldn't expect me to dance. A burly white guy in a skin-tight black t-shirt nodded to Kyrie and opened a solid metal door. A feeling of foreboding filled me as I looked down the dark staircase on the other side. How much did I really know about Kyrie? Did I really want to go down there with a girl who I had only known for a few hours? With a girl who had just watched a live kidnapping and done nothing to stop it? Kyrie looked up at me with her dark, curious almond eyes before I knew it. We checked our coats and descended into XXY. With the glowing red lights, fog machine, and writhing shapes, the club reminded me of hell. The heat from so many dancing bodies made it about as warm, too. We squeezed our way through the sweaty crowd to the bar, where Kyrie gestured to a guy in a leather vest and chaps who looked like a supermodel. Moments later, he slid an old-fashioned over to me. How had she known it was my favorite drink? I reached for my wallet, but Kyrie shook her head. Do you come here often? I shouted lamely over the pounding music. Almost never. Kyrie laughed. But there's something that I want you to see. I groaned inwardly. Not again. Kyrie gently touched my wrist. She pointed to a tall, bald African man in a suit. His hollow eyes were locked on a skinny blonde guy wearing a mesh t-shirt. The college kid was clearly hopped up on the Red Bull vodka drinks. That were the club's specialty, dancing his head off in the heart of the crowd. As the hollow-eyed man moved toward him, I realized that the man that just have a sunken face his eye sockets were completely empty, with nothing inside of them but hungry darkness. The crowd parted for him. People seemed unconsciously repulsed by the gaunt figure, even though I had the strangest feeling that they couldn't even see him. The hollow-eyed man halted just in front of the blonde dancer, and when he did, the young man froze. In fact, everyone froze, from the bartender to the raving crowd, all their heads drop to their chests just as though they'd fallen asleep standing up. Deafening dance music boomed from the speakers for a completely still and silent crowd. The hollow-eyed men lifted the blonde dancer's chin, their lips clamped together in a violet kiss. The dancer's throat grew swollen, bulging as the hollow-eyed man sucked the life from him. I tried to move, but couldn't. I was just as paralyzed as everyone else. It felt like an eternity before the dancer crumpled to the ground, a hollow sack of skin and bones. Beneath his mesh t-shirt, he had the starved look of a death camp victim. The hollow-eyed man scanned the room, apparently satisfied for now, to my surprise and terror, he nodded in our direction before walking no, drifting up the stairs. The metal door slammed shut, and every head in the club snapped up at once. People blinked confusedly and resumed dancing, oblivious to the grotesque sight on the floor. Kyrie took her fingers off of my wrist and gave me a look I recognized. We as should go. Am I all right? I suggested, unable to control the shaking in my voice. Kyrie nodded and led me upstairs through the oblivious crowd. Outside, I lost it. Okay, I don't know what this is, but it is not a date. Hot? Kyrie put a fist on her hip. I thought for sure you would have pieced everything together by now. This isn't funny, I shouted. People are getting hurt. What the hell was that thing? Come with me to one last place. Kyrie grabbed my hand with both of hers. If you still don't understand why I'm doing this, I'll tell you after. I promise. Besides, aren't you hungry? I was starving, actually. But it was after 2 a.m. and the roads were slick with ice. 
where the hill was going to be open at this time of night. Thirty minutes later, Carrie watched me wolf down my syrupy waffles and cheesy hash browns with a bemused expression on her face. Cho, what you want to shoo me at a pancake house, I asked through a mouthful of food. I just wanted you to eat a nice meal so you don't start feeling faint. Carrie smirked. Don't you believe me? I shook my head. I just saw a guy get his guts sucked out like he was a goddamn crazy straw. I'm not sure what to believe anymore. Could that means you're getting closer to the truth. Kyrie ran her fingers up my forearm. Come to the bathroom with me. What, here? Nah, I looked around incredulously. Kyrie lifted an eyebrow and guided me toward the restrooms. I blushed, sure that someone would see when Kyrie yanked me by the collar through the door of the men's restroom. There was no one standing at the three sticky urinals or sitting in either of the two stalls, no one who I could see anyway. Kyrie took me into the smaller stall, locked the door, then pulled me up so we were both standing on the toilet lid. There was barely enough room on the white plastic for both of us. I could feel our chests pressed together, her fingers on my back. The restroom door flew open, and a guy in dirty black boot staggered in. Dumb slut, he moaned to himself as he struggled to find his zipper. I spent like thirty bucks on her tonight. She owes me through the crack in the stall door. I could see where the drunk braced himself against a urinal. It was Johnny. From where he stood, pissing, he couldn't see the pale, naked, genderless figure that was crawling out of the ceiling tile and down the wall. Kyrie covered my mouth a split second before I screamed. The pale thing approached Johnny silently from behind until its gnarled toes were practically touching his heels. Oblivious, Johnny zipped up, but before he could turn around, the pale thing stepped into him. Johnny's clothes and skin yielded like foam as it slipped on his flesh like a pajama once His face shifted from shock to agony and finally to horror before finally settling into an expression of featureless calm. The new Johnny paused in front of the mirror, trying out his hands and fingers like stiff new gloves. Those hands combed apart into Johnny's usually unruly hair, then crashed his chest with the glee of a long cage animal finally set free. Every trace of drunkenness was gone. The door slammed shut as a shiny new Johnny left the restroom with swift, professional strides. What the fuck? I mouthed to Kyrie. She jumped gracefully down from the toilet, unlocked the door, and motioned for me to follow. There's there as things like that everywhere, aren't there? I stammered. We just don't notice them. Especially tonight, Kyrie nodded. All the eager couples, the first dates, the hookups, the alcohol, and loneliness Valenti's day is a feast date for creatures like these. You said that there was nothing worse than being alone on Valentine's Day. I wanted to show you that you were wrong and to protect you. If you did go out, but we, when you yelled at Johnny that night, I could tell that you'd lost someone special. The addiction Kyrie rolled up her long sleeves. The track marks were too obvious. I couldn't stop myself from reaching out to touch them. I did, too. Kyrie went on myself. Two horrible truth struck me at once. There was no pulse in the veins beneath my fingertips, and according to the mirror across from UC was alone in the men's room. I was already on my way out from an OD when my sir sunk her fangs into my neck. It's a shame. If we'd met when I was still alive, we might have been very happy together. I backed away until my back pressed against the cool tie wall. I hope you heed my warning. 
when I tell you to hurry home and that you remember this lesson for next year. Carrie smiled, the night is young, you see, and I still need to feed.